Thank you, Dr. Kritika, for being able to join on time. We were uh, thinking how you can uh, join on time. Thank you so much. Uh, so today we'll be talking about and discussing about uh, delirium, which is a very, very important topic uh, in palliative care, especially in palliative care, because uh, uh, we do see that quite often and the management is uh, something that we need to learn a little bit. This is something very interesting for the patient as well as for the caregiver. So until and unless you manage that properly, it is going to give a lot of burden uh, among the caregivers. Uh, it's not that uh, uh, pleasant for patient also because many a times they can recollect what happened when they were delirious. So today we have uh, Dr. Kritika as our faculty. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Palliative Medicine and Supportive Care at KMC Manipal. Uh, she has done her MD in palliative medicine from uh, Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. And she's leading the pediatric palliative care. Uh, she has special interest in pediatric palliative care at uh, Manipal Hospital, where they have integrated uh, palliative care for uh, children with life-limiting illnesses. Uh, so I welcome Dr. Kritika for this session. Uh, I think she's on a call. She'll be joining us. Screen. Yes, we can we can see the screen. I don't know for some reason I'm not able to share the PPT directly, so I had to open the screen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oops. So, as a topic we know is about how to assess for, manage, identify delirium in palliative care. So, before I begin, there are, there, are, there are these certain myths that we may have had across, come across, or maybe have thought across in our practice that, you know, that times uh, some of us do feel that, you know, yes, delirium is easily identifiable. Like, you know, you, you see a patient and you say that this is delirium. Uh, before we even uh, evaluate or you know at times you know before we even have to you know differentiate between different uh, presentations then it is all about you know a delirium monitoring will not lead to a change in patient care it's actually uh, wrong there is a lot of uh, emphasis given in terms of trying to prevent delirium rather than you know, uh, treat in the end. So now there are a lot of emphasis can be given on prevention. And that also is important in patient care when we're dealing with such sicker patients when we see in palliative care. And it also, uh, there's a lot of talk about, you know, if a patient is delirious, the, the first and foremost thing is stop everything that we are giving to this patient, anything which has sedative action or anything which may cause, uh, you know, uh, episodes of uh, restlessness or it could cause, uh, Delirious, uh, delirium episodes or like such, such such kind of that and you might talk about you know doing all of that in the first instance without even wanting to go and evaluate to find out what would be the likely cause and uh, diagnosis is mainly around you know trying to find out that the patient might be crazy so it's about the terms that we use with families it's about the terms that we tell describe and how the family understands a given situation what is their expectation out of your management, whether when we talk about, you know, trying to start antipsychotics, uh, the first and foremost thing for a lay person would be like antipsychotics, meaning is the person gone mad. Are they uh, not someone who will get back to normal? So it is all about communication at that point of time, like how and what are we dealing with? What is likely to reverse? How much are we likely to reverse? Whether the management would stay for a longer period or it's just for a short period, depending upon the etiology of it. So to take you on to that, we will discuss through this topic about what is it, why is it important to, you know, address delirium, what would be the likely causes which we see in our setting and the management for it. So a little history back, you know, and to times to understand what delirious is. So the term, Latin term, the delirium is to be crazy and delirium means to leave the furrows. So it's from leaving from your natural state or your like, or your actual state of a state of mind or the environment. So Hippocrates in 400 BCE said that they move the face, they hunt in empty air, pluck nap from the bedclothes, 
all these signs are bad and in fact deadly you know this was our time you know trying to recognize what terminal delirium was someone who is terminally ill that's when they found out that patients are becoming uh, delirious where they are confused they don't understand and they are you know hunting in the empty air trying because they are hallucinating probably they have visual and auditory hallucination this is how hippocrates described it then slowly in first century bce celsus said that then sick people they lose their judgment and talk incoherently when the violence of the fit is abated and the judgment presently returns so it's all about how the fluctuation occurs how things so this is so many years ago it was identified and you know trying to understand what exactly happens and instead of labeling a person crazy or psychotic so symptoms would be very synonymous with an acute confusional state or someone with an organic brain syndrome or an encephalopathy or in terminal agitation so it's often mistaken you know in times with patients with depression clinical depression major depression dementia features as well as an anxiety another important thing that to understand is what is terminal agitation it is actually a sign or a symptom seen which is suggestive of you know a thrashing or agitation that may occur in the few days or hours of life so it's only we would say that you know this person is who is at end of life who is actively dying would be going through such a state and that could be likely complicated or precipitated due to you know an underlying uncontrolled pain due to anxiety around that you know the person would be really uh, uh, there would be a lot of existential spiritual distress that could be probably leading for this patient to become very uh, agitated there could be a uh, intractable dyspnea or even at terms due to metabolic or septic causes causing delirium so there is definitely criteria and one such the dsm5 which defines a clear cut de uh, definition for what how would you classify this patient as delirious is based on these four categories the so the dsm5 criteria a is a disturbance in attention so it is completely in terms of reducing ability to direct or to keep a focus or sustain that attention or they have shifting attention and awareness of their surroundings so whether they have a reduced orientation to their environment then this disturbance which develops over a short period of time usually you you would see that patients would have had such episodes in the last few hours to a few days that's how they would present to the opd saying that past few days this patient has been day by day you know behaving uh, vague or odd or has been agitated suddenly so it may not be like a very long course and it that that is what it represents a change from the baseline attention and awareness and it will tend to fluctuate in severity during a course of the day something what we have heard of like sundowning phenomenon saying that when the sun goes down or when the when the uh, when the evening starts you know the night sets in the agitation episodes or the the restlessness episodes worsen in a patient so that is what we call as a sundowning phenomenon another criteria additionally is uh, additional disturbance in cognition so in cognition various uh, things like memory deficits would be there disorientation language skills visual spatial ability or perception of any surrounding so that is also impaired so when you look at these criteria it should also be uh, checked into that whether these criteria are not explained by any other pre existing or an established neurocognitive disorder and it is not occurring in a context of a severely reduced level of arousal such as coma so we have to delineate these other neurocognitive disorders and only and only then this if these these are uh, above about three criteria are present is when you would classify this patient as delirious so it comes to you know it takes us to this topic about what would be the types we would have seen patients jumping out of bed trying to get restless pull out ivs uh, pull out tubes you know ng tubes especially you know anything that is irritating that they might be very uh, trying in trying to be you know uh, causing self harm like in this picture that you see on the right top corner that patient is almost halfway out of the bed despite you having the bed rails in place which is mainly talking about hyperactive delirium where a person is combative agitated or restless or a patient could be in hypoactive delirium where they are very lethargic they are sedated they are superous uh, they are most of the time sleeping 
there's not much of a response and you might occasionally hear some moaning and groaning and mild movement in the bed here and there it could either be classified very classically into hyperactive or they could be in hypoactive or you might rather actually find in a general case scenario for them fluctuating between the groups they might at times be very much you know drowsy sedated sleeping no response and suddenly after a period of while they'll be like all awake and trying to jump out of the bed or at times they would be alert and calm also so there the fluctuations is there you would call as a mixed pattern of delirium so with it is not very a uh, classical that you know a particular kind of suppose say a septic encephalopathy a patient will be in hyperactive delirium only or somebody with metabolic would be in hypoactive it varies with patient to patient so it's not about that you know particular type of presentation is seen in particular type of cause but when we talk about delirium and as i said earlier about that we there are chances that we may miss it because it is invariably uh miss due to a di miss diagnosis that it could be seen in dementia or in patients with major clinical depression so there are, this table gives you an idea about how you can differentiate and understand what is delirium versus dementia versus depression so the major character features that you would want to differentiate in is in terms of onset it will be acute in delirium where it will be from hours to days whereas in dementia it will be very insidious that is it will be from months to years slowly there is a de uh, decreasing cognitive function decreasing uh, attention span and uh, even uh, their activity levels it could be over a period of months to years whereas with depression it could be from acute to insidious the course in delirium would be obviously as i talked about earlier would be fluctuating they would be hyperactive alert or calm or hypoactive and it could vary in the daytime whereas in dementia and depression there would be progressive and maybe chronic also in a same similarly with the duration delirium will last for hours to weeks dementia from months to years depression from months to years especially in patients who have been diagnosed with major clinical depression who are who are on antidepressants for many periods and there may be occasional uh, other you know aggravating of symptoms in the such patients when you look at consciousness levels they will it will be very clear in depression patients may not be uh, stuporous or sedated well in depression in dementia usually it will be clear but at times as the as as the disease course advances in advanced dementia patients who are mainly bed bound and uh, towards end of life then there will be definitely a decreasing level of consciousness but otherwise it will be always clear whereas in delirium consciousness level will always be altered attention will always be impaired compared to dementia and depression where it will be maybe decrease or it uh, may be not close to normal if it is a person is uh, well controlled on medications in terms of psychomotor changes it may be you know uh, increased or decreased depending upon the cause and reversibility is usually reversible in delirium compared to dementia it is irreversible and in depression it is usually reversible because uh, good antidepressants and psychotherapy can help the person delirium if it's not terminal is usually reversible so this is very important when we are trying to delineate or identify and diagnose for such a patient that comes us to you know to understand that how and why is this important why do we think we should be addressing delirium as a symptom in our practice especially among patients who present to the palliative care clinic because it is one of the most commonly missed or misdiagnosed or mismanaged and uh, it is there are a lot of confusing terminologies because at times we talk about encephalopathy we at times we talk about uh, psychosis here in between and uh, and often in routine practices in certain areas there's a lot of use of sedatives in patients with uh, a palliative care they may not there will be chronic insomnia there will be chronic uh, there would be anxiety there would be uh, pain for which you're using medication that that can cause sedation and at times this symptom could be missed while managing when you look at its presence like you know approximately 15 to 25 percent of hospitalized patients and up to 16 percent 60 percent elderly in hospital will have this symptom and it occurs in almost 70% of icu patients wherein you have it and 
85 percent who are in their terminal phase of their illness like that's what is like terminal delirium so it's that's why it's so important because delirium is common and it can be very distressful it can be very harmful because your delirium affects or increases the hospital length of stay because imagine of a caregiver like who is looking at their family member or their loved one going through such distress may not want to manage such a patient at home or may not be able to because it's very challenging someone who is in hypoactive delirium for them to see their loved one sleeping like this not knowing what to do they might feel very helpless at that point of time and that may lead them to have this patient brought to the hospital you know and that would uh, mean that you would want go for uh, evaluating the cause the entire workup and then management for the same and that would add to the length of stay that leading to adding to that would be financial toxicity because of the length of stay in the hospital the number of investigations and other means that you do not that i'm saying that it is bad to do it but it has this significant cost involved in it delirium can yes cause death if it is not identified early because of the other the, the etiology due to that a uh, lot of issue a uh, lot of concern is in terms of transition of a patient from hospital to a nursing care or nursing hospital you know a smaller nursing home or a home care base and additional costs involved with this the hidden costs that come with this burden because you might have to have maybe like a round the clock nurse involved or maybe some caregiver might have to give up their job and sit at home with the patient because there's nobody else to look after so there are these hidden costs involved which are like what we call as indirect Uh, uh you know financial toxicity and direct financial toxicity and also with that comes in the caregiver burden because looking after a person who is delirious meaning look a completely uh, the person is completely dependent on the caregiver for all their needs and as well as it's a physical burden as well as an emotional burden to see your loved one go through that so that's why it's that's why i term this you know as delirium is harmful in these particular state it also hurts relationships because it interferes with you know having a meaningful conversation with or interaction with the caregivers the person is not able to communicate family is helpless distressed not knowing what to do what this person might be needing what are they demanding for uh their helplessness would in terms increase their anxiety would uh, increase their thought process of feeling you know hopeless in this situation as to how best they can you know uh support their loved one in this situation and that can br uh, bring an impact on the relationships that the person has with the caregiver other is the caregiver distress because unlike pain like you know pain you can see you can manage and you can you know you can keep on adding, adding other analgesics and try and bring about a control in your but you know sometimes the delirium is seen and it creates a sense of fear and helplessness that i talked about earlier so it adds to the caregiver distress in you so you know at this it comes to a junction that you know we understand what is delirium we understand that you know why it is important to you know, really have a look at it why should we be more particularly aware about it but also it brings us to this important topic about what causes it and how to be identified what all work up do we need to do for a such a patient how would you want to assess a particular patient and then you know come to a diagnosis so before we move on to what would be the causes we should know also what are the patients who are at risk of it and majority of the time these are the very common risk factors it would be the physical function as in patient who is mainly bed bound who is not involved in much of activities completely dependent on their caregiver uh, patients habits in terms of uh, the sleep wake cycle their uh, uh, food in intake habits their dietary habits bowel bladder function is also very important because uh, constipation also is seen to cause delirium in elderly you know i had a case in an opd where a, where a where elderly lady had come with in you know, altered sensorium where she was very agitated and we did her entire work up found out uh, on history taking is where we got to know she had not passed stools and we did an x ray abdomen and we found that it, that she had impacted heart stools in the rectum and after a good 
you know management for it and once it was relieved of automatically the sensorium came back to the normal so it could also be attributed to such a cause it is important to see patient's habits cognitive status before the event itself like how i talked about in patients who are bed bound with who is bound to have multiple electro electrolyte imbalances uh whether in patients with dementia also it could lead to in such cases in early dementia it could lead to in such cases so it's important to know this the drug history is one of the most important big cause palliative care there is a lot of polypharmacy because you are managing a lot of symptoms at a time patients who are from the non oncology like you know cancer patients yes definitely after their entire treatment pattern is over you they would be only on symptom control medications but at times they would also have comorbidities for which drugs would be ongoing so drug to drug interactions to be looked at any drugs that could lead to certain electrolyte abnormalities have to be looked at whether any drugs can cause uh sedation that needs to be looked at so it's important that we take a good drug history look for any sensory deficits that this patient would have like namely hearing loss also hearing loss can also tend to you know cause delirium in certain patients they would tend to i'm not uh, misidentify not understand what's happening around them that would help that would you know prevent them to have their normal functioning in place then an environmental change like um in like in an when you when you see patients why do we talk about you know icu patients being disturbed or an altered sense of sensorium because of mainly being subjected to artificial light in the icu constantly there is you know the machines beeping people coming in uh you know there is a sister who is drawing up blood the doctors are coming in every few hourly and assessing the patient and there's constant disturbance this environmental change can also cause patients to go into a short frame of you know uh, altered sensory for a period, maybe for a short period of time what we term as icu psychosis but this is delirium due to environmental change and more likely to happen in patients who are elderly who are prone to so uh, who are bed bound who have had history of any other comorbidities which can lead to that so that's why you know our our emphasis when we are trying to manage is all based upon these risk factors decrease oral intake especially fluid intake and dehydration can also lead patients to go into these acute episodes of delirium and other medical problems mainly being other comorbidities so once we've identified or have a general idea about the major risk factors that are present which can have a patient to go into delirium other causes so this chart kind of summarizes in general about what all the other various presentations that come to up that that we see in our practice and that could cause delirium so which i it initially when i talked about electrolyte imbalance mainly hypercalcemia malignant hypercalcemia hyponatremia hypernatremia can also hypomagnesemia i have seen a patient uh, in my practice that i was in my residency where a person with magnesium level of 1.0 mg per dl had come to the opd and that was only after we sent up a workup initially we did not know and we uh, the patient was actually a known case of carcinoma lung with a brain metastasis so we attributed it to raised icd but you know when we went ahead and examining on sent for evaluation we found magnesium levels to be extremely low and with correction the sensorium improved and the patient got better and went home so there we need to be very mindful that whenever we see any uh, patient in the opd we go through all of this like a checklist to kind of rule out what all other what all are the causes for delirium so dehydration organ failure there are paraneoplastic syndromes endocrine and hypoglycemia and hypothyroidism where we are aware infection can lead to you know septic encephalopathy hypoxemia Uh, side effects of any radiation or chemotherapy so patients undergoing wbrt can can present with symptoms due to raised icd so it is important that we also see this aspect medications as i discussed and any other intracranial pathology and other medical conditions where like you see in withdrawal symptoms due to alcohol withdrawal or any opioid withdrawal nicotine withdrawal nutritional deficiencies coagulopathy or anemia this sums up a, a very much kind of the present that various presentations that you would see in our patients and 
ruling out these causes who will be like you know half your job the job is done because you would have known what is the etiology and you're correcting the correctable and managing that so when we look at now assessing this patient this once we know what would be the likely causes and we want to look at assessing this flow chart kind of gives you a very uh, one shot one look and you can understand at what are the various features of this uh, patients who are in delirium and able to clearly identify those patients earlier so it is like a sequence of events that happens initially in most of the patients the sleep is affected where there will be altered sleep wake cycle slowly affecting uh, the patient's affect and mood where they will be more irritable or anxious they will be either in anger or fear or paranoia of some some of the other events or some person later on affecting attention and orientation where there's loss of orientation to time place and person or difficulty in maintaining attention there will be impact on language where there will be disorganized thinking or there will be illogical speech psychomotor affectors is there where there will be more agitated or very very quiet or in between fluctuating and eventually into consciousness where there have been altered sensorium so keeping in mind these various clinical features of delirium we want to assess this patient and that there are certain ways objective ways of assessing a patient in delirium so the first and foremost thing would be about is to let, step one would be about assessing for consciousness and for content of thought so now you would identify that within this you know this slide you would get to know about why this radio and why am i looking at various topics in this so have you ever used a radio in your past anyone who has had an idea about using a radio and what all turn up buttons do you see on that okay so there is one for volume there is one for frequency and there is also one in for where you would want to change in the channel in that number so it is all about talking about alertness awareness and awakeness so where you in terms of when you look at consciousness it has to complete all of these three a's only then can you call a person completely fully conscious that they are alert to their surrounding and alert with their environment they are aware of their environment and keeping in track of the oriented to the person to the place to the time of the day and they are awake as in they are they are awake with their eyes open they are understanding what's happening to them logical reasoning is there and when you look at consciousness you also look at content so when you look at their awake awakeness alertness alert, awareness content of thought their speech the kind of speech output the logical reasoning that they are able to make all of this has to be evaluated when you check for delirium later when you look for is a, a very objective scale is the ras the ras pal richman agitation sedation scale which has been modified in the palliative care setting and in this setting it gives you either the neutral that is a normal state will be zero where the person will be alert and calm plus scores that plus scores are patients for any in anybody who is in hyperactive delirium and the minus scores are for patients who are in hypoactive delirium so depending upon whether they are in in the plus score say restless agitated very agitated and combative it will you can score the patient based upon this or in person who is in hypoactive delirium you can score the patient upon this now why this chart this chart can objectively also help you to track the progress of this patient based upon your intervention so you can very objectively see based upon the description given in this chart where uh, where all this person was and how with your intervention is there an improvement or if there is a worsening so it helps you to objectively track and chart and also document in your medical records for you to be very sure as to what level was this patient when they turned up and at what level are they when they are at the end of your treatment then when you talk about content in content i talked when i when i discussed about is earlier is about looking at acute change of fluctuating course of mental status 
inattention, altered level of consciousness and disorganized thinking. So all of these four features are part of the confusion assessment method that is the CAM. So the CAM includes these four features. So when you look at feature one, acute onset and fluctuating course, it is obviously you will be obtaining it from a family member or the nurse attending. You would want to know the variation of the mental status. Is there a change from the baseline and how much and does it fluctuate? Attention, that is, is the person having easy, uh, is, is the person being easily distractible or having difficulty in keeping track of what you're talking and what you're telling them? They're not able to focus on to what when you are speaking. Do they have a disorganized speech rather like, you know, they're having an irrelevant conversation. They might talk about one topic and suddenly shift to something randomly different topic, not at all related to each other. Or they might, that's what we call as an illogical flow of ideas or, um, you know, just kind of rambling some words, muttering some words, which, which make no sense at all. And in the end, about altered level of consciousness, where you see the patient is not alert, they are not vigilant, or they are very lethargic, or they're stuporous or in coma, that is unarousable. So you can make a diagnosis of delirium when you have either of the presence of features one and two with either three and four. So feature one and two have to be present, with three or four either or being present to be able to make a diagnosis for delirium. So these two methods can easily help you to objectively assess for and consider that this patient would be in delirium or you know delineated from the other that I talked about like in dementia or in depression, anxiety methods where you find a similar presentation. Other similar bedside tests for attention would be orientation to time, or asking them to do multiples of two or count from 20 backwards up to one, spelling and reversal of the spelling, giving them short term, uh, uh, you know, like looking at their short term memory. So memory recall with maybe you might have just greeted them with your name. And after a while you ask them what your name was. So that would test that. And it's easier to, easier to do that than asking them to, you know, three uh, paired, uh, give them three paired objects or three unpaired objects. And when I talk about dysgraphia, we come to this where we talk about, you know, the uh, MMSE items which we use for screening, for sensorium, where we look at orientation to year, date, backward spelling and copying a design. But at the same time, if you do a clock drawing test in such patients, so on the left, if you see, I, you know, the examiner would give them a certain time, a certain time and they're supposed to draw that. It was initially not done in the correct way. They had lost the visuospatial orientation there where the numbers are interchanged and it's not correctly written. But whereas after an intervention, it changed into a normal uh, pat, normal uh, clock that you would have expected them to draw and that has a 92% sensitivity. So these simple tests would be easier for you to document also because this is important in terms of medical documentation for you to know the progress that this patient has made or if the patient has worsened. As I talked about previously about terminal delirium as being one of the most important topics when we are discussing delirium because it is mainly a diagnosis of exclusion or very, very much in practice done when after the patient has died that you would expect that you would identify that, okay, this delirium was likely due to be terminal delirium because it may not be really very clear cut, you know, you might be seeing patients with acute uh, sickness, say like somebody has come with aspiration pneumonia, say in a known case of carcinoma esophagus and has had an aspiration pneumonia as admitted, you're treating for that. If you might find this patient has developed certain other electrolyte abnormalities or even treating for that at the same time. And this patient continues to be in delirium, but day by day clinically, you don't see much of an improvement. Delirium doesn't improve. And either expected or unexpected, the patient dies at times, you might introspect and reflect back at what happened to this patient and see the care given to this patient. And at that time, you might feel that, okay, this delirium episode would have likely been due to terminal delirium. So it's mainly a diagnosis of exclusion at times seen after that too. Other things that could help you to identify terminal delirium is that mainly it will be in some patient who is sicker, who has continues to worsen day by day with clinical deterioration. Other signs of dying process are you know, usually present. And there may be multiple causes and often irreversible. Like you have been trying your best to correct the correctables and you don't see much of an improvement and rather 
newer newer issues coming up for the worsening of uh, sepsis or metabolic imbalance all of that would help you point out towards that this could likely be terminal delirium so when we look at management next management heavily relies on weighing the benefits versus burden you'd want to know based upon the goals of care of this particular patient as to how you're going to proceed and manage so as i talked about previously prevention at all times would be the most important mainstay in managing delirium along with trying to see whether you can modify the risk factors that we initially saw trying to correct the correctable and along with that continue with doing non pharmacological treatment and pharmacological treatment so i would like to just pose it to the group would they want to take a go at any of this as to in their practice any if someone who would you know help me in this in their practice what all do they advise when they look at prevention for the lenient like a simple advice that you would give for your patients what all aspects would you like to cover and you're talking about preventing delirium is anybody replying on chat can you see the chat uh, dr prithika yeah just now i just opened it i didn't know that they had put up on the chat oh yes yes they were responding in the chat for your previous question yes also. so keep them aware about the day and night give them a newspaper to read yes excellent so that you keep them oriented to the time and maintain electrolytes yes absolutely look at trying to keep a balance of that in the icu scenario orient to the day and night yes yes about electrolytes preventing dehydration absolutely correct correct you would want to go and see or modify those risk factors that we had so in, a, in along with trying to keep the day night orientation in place what all you want to do is in the in that is you can have such kind of a prevention protocol for delirium where one is orienting them to the time place known faces that you can have so showing them pictures of family members or having uh, postcards of you know or maybe small photograph printouts in front of them in their bed or on the phone telling them to uh, you know recognize those faces asking them to you know uh, identify them on probably nowadays we have video call facility so have family coming in on video call and talk to them and asking them to identify that point of time when i talk about stimulation stimulation is by means of you know constant kind of brain stimulation in terms of exercises small small exercises like trying to make them recall what they had for breakfast trying to recall who came in the morning today or you tell them a particular time or today's date and after a while you ask them to recall what date it was so if you daily stimulate like this it helps them to kind of remember and try to keep that attention or focus in place now by mobilizing is most of the i understand patients who are immobilized due to probably a paraparesis or paraplegia or who have a fracture and they're not able to get out of the bed but definitely in certain patients who are able to at least you can mobilize them by shifting them onto a wheelchair and making them go around in the room outside of their room into the into the other other areas of the house or even out of the house into the garden down if they are, if that is feasible because that will help them be aware of their surrounding come in contact to a lot of stimulation external stimulation and help them to be aware of their senses sleep is important because here you want to help them maintain a normal sleep wake cycle so to keep that uh, normal circadian rhythm you might have to imply rely heavily on sleep hygiene now sleep hygiene is taught in a lot of patients where you inculcate certain sleep habits certain uh, kind of activities around or before a sleep hour so that it goes into a routine practice that a person will fall asleep at that particular time and wake up at a certain time and sleep hygiene has an important role when you're trying to you know manage in patients with delirium so that's the most important non pharmacological approach in your and sleep hygiene would be mainly based on uh, you know uh, not using any medications to treat insomnia unless otherwise it has been managed with sleep hygiene 
So that's how you would proceed in this. Creating a restful nighttime environment, so which is most important, like which is not possible in an ICU scenario. Patients are sicker there, they need to be monitored. So in the night, two o'clock, a nurse comes in and checks the uh, vitals, is injecting some medications that might cause slight pain and the person wakes up and may not be able to fall asleep again. And again, that cycle just keeps on continuing. But you can definitely try and see whether you can minimize interventions in the night. If a person does not need such amount of you know, rigorous vitals and monitoring, may try to stop it after 10 o'clock and again, initiate that from morning six o'clock. Try to adjust dosages of medications in such a way that they're given during the wakeful hours or during the daytime hours and none of the medications are given in the night. Similar, simple thing is trying to give medications like you know uh, diuretics earlier in the day, not after six o'clock in the evening, so that you are uh, so that the person doesn't wake up in the middle of the night to go past urine. So that's a very small, simple approach that you can do to you know kind of set this routine in place and create a restful nighttime environment. Also, see and hear, meaning constant stimulation by looking around having people uh, talk to them, show uh, pictures, or have familiar things that, uh, that they would have in their house, in the hospital, by their bedside, for them to be aware of their surroundings. Eat and drink as per goals of care. So when I write as per goals of care is because probably a person who was at end of life may not have intact swallowing, intact, uh, or, that, or that demand to have you know, hydration needs met or food uh, intake met. So that's why, depending upon the goals of care, you should lay emphasis on how much a person would want to eat, the kind of food that they want to eat, and their hydration status. So having this kind of prevention protocol for delirium helps you to mainly manage or guide family members about how they can try and prevent. This pictorial representation is all about that. So it's uh, another thing is, you know, hearing aids that you see. Uh, a spectacle. So sometimes that uh, patients may not be able to read and you tell them, you know, keep reading newspapers and all and the person would have forgotten their spectacles at home. And family would also not be completely aware because at the time their focus is all on trying to treat this patient, get this person better and take him back home. And they would have forgotten a simple thing of carrying his spectacles, his or her spectacles. And he, then you were telling them about reading the newspaper and they are not able to, but you might not ask the question that why are you not reading the newspaper and a simpler answer could be that I don't have my spectacles in place how would I read a newspaper to know you know what is the latest news or what is the date or today or what is the time what is the month today or what is the news about today so that is important to have their uh, uh, their needs assessed uh, their familiar things around them around their bedside so somebody might have like there are people who have a soft toy or they might have uh, there are people who want to read uh, uh, certain spiritual books uh, either or, or are, are books like Quran or Bhagavad Gita or Hanuman Chalisa or their Bible then you would want them to have that by their bedside people have a habit of chanting with beads uh, somebody might want to use a rosary Hindus might want to use a bead chain to you know chant mantras and that might be they have been their regular habit previously, but when they don't have it here and they're not able to understand, maybe bringing those all familiar objects in their surrounding might help them. Obviously care, their walking aids, and trying to see to keep the clock in visibility, trying to keep a calendar in front of them and telling them about, you know, this is the date today, you go and cross it. And tomorrow next day asking them, what is the date today? And then you cross it. So that's how you might bring them back into orientation. Other techniques is about trying to reduce noise and uh, especially in patients who are delirious, we should, you know, we should, uh, we should do away from physically restraining them because the more you physically restrain them, the more they're going to become agitated and would lead to some or the other harm, especially elderly population. The physical restraints can lead to severe bruising on their arms and cause issues due to that. And that's why we should always not always remember that not to go for physical restraints and look at probably using uh, sedatives and antipsychotics to bring down the hyperactive delirium symptoms at that point of time. The other two pictures, most of you might be familiar that I talked about, you know, the environment change impacts 
how the attention and alertness for a person is. So an ICU may have artificial light with no uh, sunlight exposure inside it might be difficult for them. So you might want to uh, shift the person out of the ICU as soon as possible into the ward setting with surrounded by their familiar people, have the family draw, you know, out the curtains in the daytime so that the natural light flows inside the house uh, or the room and uh, evening close it back again so that the body understands the diurnal variation of the day and night and accordingly the circadian rhythm sets back into normal. So that's important how the light and environmental uh, you know, changes take place and have an impact on maintaining this. The other thing that you see in this picture is also the drug chart. It's important that I talk about the drug charts where uh, we have seen as commonly given dexamethasone. Now, dexa is known to cause psychosis-like symptoms or insomnia in patients. And very often it's given as, you know, an 8 hourly dose or a 12 hourly dose. Nurses might not look at the timings and they might just give it at 9 o'clock in the morning and 9 o'clock in the night. And next day the complaint from the family member is this person has not slept at all. You might want to go back onto the charts and see whether, okay, yes, should I do or not? Now, the foremost important reason why dexamethasone causes it because of its glucocorticoid action, where it interferes into the cortisol production and hence leads to symptoms of insomnia or restlessness. So if we can time the dosage of dexamethasone in terms of times of the regular normal cortisol surge, say like morning 8 o'clock and give no dose after 6 o'clock, even if you have to stretch it up to, then you might try to avert the symptoms in such patients and bring down the effects, side effects due to this drug. So it's important that we also lay emphasis in trying to see the drug charts and time, time the medication in such a way that they don't interfere with sleep. So when I talked about prevention, modifying risk factors, we also have to look about at the reversible factors which are there. So it's all, which I talked about correcting the correctables. So identifying the, the etiology and correctly managing it is important. So commonly you would see is in hypoxia patients with uh, who are with probably say in our setting with lung metastasis, who are uh, presenting with symptoms with breathlessness on examination would find it and that would be causing restlessness episodes. So managing those infections, electrolyte abnormality, drugs of toxicity that I talked about. The encephalopathy could be due to metabolic, could be due to septic, uh, CNS infections are there and also in patients with raised intracranial pressure. So these are the commonly identifying ones. There could be many other more, which I haven't listed here, but looking at at least trying to find out whether there's anything reversible and trying to manage that before laying it as intractable delirium is important. When you look at management for, for say further, it in terms of non-pharmacological treatment lays an important emphasis along with prevention strategies and modifying the risk factors. So it's about reorientation, reality testing, reassurance, explanation and anxiety reduction. I might take a pause. Sri Devi, I have time. How much left to complete this? Uh, you can take around uh, 10 minutes, 5 to 10 minutes. Okay, I should be able to cover it up in that much time. Yeah. Thank you. So, reorientation by reality testing, reassurance and explanation and anxiety reduction is important. So, when I talk about reassurance, is like, you know, person would be absolutely not able to understand what's happening, they would have just fed them and after a while they said that I'm still hungry or you haven't given me. And at times the caregiver is so burdened that they might tend to have either get angry or may scold the person and that a person is still confused as to why am I being scolded. at. I just asked for something which I know is not yet been done, but you know that it has been done and this person doesn't know about it or isn't aware. So probably at that point of time, calmly reassuring them Explaining them what is happening might go a better way in managing the symptoms rather than trying to, you know, be irritated or scold them or, you know, shut them up and things like that. Other talks, other things that I talked about in risk factors were the environmental change where you would want to control the noise, light intensity, sleep hygiene, improving the staff patient communication, staff consistency, as well as the caregiver consistency. If you keep changing the caregivers who are there, so it's important that you know you tell your family that you're caring for. 
that the caregiver at least in such point of time to be consistent because at times families will be confused as to what is happening around them the different caregivers coming in at times they might even go into a feeling of paranoia also against the family members they might not identify who the family member is and then will refuse care being given by them so having a similar staff seeing this patient same caregiver for the first initial few days is important and this would cover up under the nursing strategies when we go towards pharmacological treatment it is only to probably reduce the severity the duration and the number of episodes but it does not reduce or prevent the incidence of delirium so the common agents that we use in our practice are typical antipsychotics that is haloperidol atypical antipsychotics would be olanzapine risperidone quetiapine in such patients also we need to keep a um, keep in mind is that haloperidol when given low dose that is uh, less than 5 mg up to 5 mg per 24 hours is safe you might not have such uh, side effects or like eps or qt prolongation but yes we should be mindful that when we need to titrate the dose up and give higher and higher doses of haloperidol that would we we should be keeping in mind uh for checking for extra pyramidal symptoms and also a uh, document for a baseline ecg to rule out any qt prolongation that could occur later and to be more, and the most important thing to be kept in mind is to not give benzodiazepines when you're trying to treat for uh, symptoms of delirium that is agitation and restlessness because benzodiazepines can further worsen delirium the patients can get more agitated and more restless if you give agents like midazolam or lorazepam or diazepam or clonazepam in such patients rather use antipsychotics to bring down the restlessness so the most of the the, the psychotics antipsychotics that we would use in india especially we don't use much of fluoxetine in our practice unless we have seen that later but we use a lot of haloperidol quetiapine and olanzapine because quetiapine in, is is almost safe to be used in elderly population it has, has less eps side effects and less uh, interaction with other drugs compared to haloperidol so quetiapine when you start at 12.5 mg in the night and keep increasing the dosage to up to even 100 mg to 150 mg also has been beneficial and it gives a good uh, uh good amount of symptom control does not cause overt sedation unless the patient is on a very high dose compared to that when you see olanzapine and haloperidol also has good effects olanzapine the other benefit it has a longer duration of action its t half is 20 to 70 hours so even once a once a day dosing is helpful and enough to manage the episodes and other important thing is that you can get it in a mouth dissolving formulation too so in patients who uh, where you have uh, do not have the uh, iv access or a difficult iv access oral intake is very poor or uh, oral route is compromised therein you can you consider using mouth dissolvable uh, olanzapine or even at times even uh, mouth dissolvable haloperidol formulations are available so depending of as i as i have listed here the drugs the dosages that you can start with it you can consider using these medications in your practice when you look at the profile of these antipsychotics it's the uh, the major reason why we are considering is any uh, anti dopaminergic agents or uh, serotonin agents so here olanzapine uh, sorry haloperidol has more dopamine receptor action compared to the others and that's why it, it helps in to having a better control but because of that it can have eps or qt prolongation as one of its side effects so in pharmacological treatment management your main stay of treatment is targeted therapy which is based on the level of behavior so uh, to get an idea in terms of when it is hyperactive delirium Would rather consider asking to continue using atypical antipsychotics, and in hypoactive consider using haloperidol. Titrate medication if initial dose is not effective. So start on the lower dose and then titrate it up so that you prevent side effects like overtly sedating the patient. And you can consider switching. Say like if you are on atypical antipsychotics initially for hyperactive delirium and the patient has not responded. given the case that i recently had a such a patient there was an elderly uh, lady 
with a ca breast metastatic ca breast with a brain metastasis post uh, all disease directed treatment now only on supportive care initially she came in with raised icd we managed that and then she had a, a urine a uti because uh, of the spinal med she also has paraplegia so she was she needed a urinary catheter because of urinary retention symptoms and that led to her developing a urinary infection urosepsis almost leading to her becoming delirious again we had to increase her dosages of quetiapine starting from 12.5 to up to 100 mg over a week and with 100 mg also she did not uh, settle down she was continuing to be restless intermittently in this situation we switched her over from quetiapine to uh, equivalent equidal dose for haloperidol and with that help her to settle down and bring down the symptoms and and bring her back to a baseline self of being alert and calm and oriented to her surroundings so at such times you might want to consider switching uh, a dose uh, i mean a medication if there is no response despite you have increased to up to a maximum dose that you could in such a patient another in important means is in terms of inadequate or no responses to try and find out uh, the cause that could be there there could be multiple like in this patient initially she came with raised icd we managed the symptom it improved but later she developed urinary sepsis so then we had to again go back and find out what it could be and that's how it led us to finding about infection and then treating it and now she's better with that so it's always important to reassess the causes if there is worsening of the symptom depending on the goals of care now here if a goal of care of a family and the physician treating would be only end of life you would not want to go that time and see for any other overly expensive test yes you could do blood test once to again identify whether there's anything reversible at this point of time and which would meaningfully change the outcome of the patient then it's then it's imperative on you to go and find out otherwise you would rather stick to continuing only palliating the symptom and only and only if the it goes into an intractable symptom patient does not respond to your adequate therapy is when you want to consider increasing up to now using more of benzodiazepines or barbiturates like phenobarbital or propofol which in terms what we call it as palliative sedation so at times you might want to use like continuous infusions of uh, uh, midazolam uh, along with haloperidol or go up to phenobarbital infusions or even at times consider using propofol infusions to bring down the restlessness episodes and manage and uh, help in controlling and comforting the patient at that point of time so this brings us almost to the end of this topic where i have a few take home points and that is that delirium is common in people with a terminal illness and can be very distressing for and especially frightening for patients and those around them many factors that can contribute so it's important to identify the correct etiology and correcting the correctables supporting the person with delirium by maintaining a safe calm and quiet environment and perform and use of using the prevention protocol that i discussed about earlier uh, along with this when you look at confronting delirium it is about preventing it that is by knowing the risk factors recognize it that is by assessing it often correcting the correctables and treat it by mainly use of non pharmacological approach along with antipsychotics and sedatives if necessary when it turns into uh, intractable delirium or in terminal delirium times so that brings us to the end of my topic thank you for patient listening and answering to queries sorry i did not know as some of you were in the chat so i couldn't read through that thank you so much thank you so much ma'am for that detailed presentation hi deepak nice to hi, see you hi ma'am nice to see you too ma'am so ma'am has been my mentor when i was in kmc manipal it's always good to catch up with you ma'am same here so uh, so we have opened up the chat box uh, for questions as well as uh, if anyone would like to ask you can please unmute yourself and ask straight away So, ma'am, we have a question uh, on the chat box already from Dr. Priyanka. She is asking, can a patient have both hypo as well as hyperactive delirium? If so, what are the drugs and what dose can be prescribed? 
So one in this case again is uh, there could be such cases where they would fluctuate during the course of the day between the types of delirium. I would rather as a first choice of agent go with the atypical antipsychotics like using Qtepin if I, oral route is not compromised, trying to titrate dose on that and use mainly like haloperidol to manage breakthroughs like in case when the patient is becoming overtly agitated and restless on a background dose then I would try to increase it up and uh, go on to, you know, giving breakthrough doses of IV that time. If not managed on the oral dose, then switch over to an IV infusion of haloperidol over a period of time. Okay, I think, ma'am, uh, one of the uh, hallmarks also is that uh, the fluctuating course, right? Yes. So even, even if a person is predominantly um, in hyperactive delirium or in hyperactive delirium, they always tend to go to the other end of the spectrum as well. That is a possibility, right? Yeah. When we had a question earlier on, what is the difference between alertness and awareness? If there is a distinction, uh, if you could throw some light on that. So alertness would be in terms about uh, being alert to uh, situations in terms of like, you know, when you're talking about being alert to time, being alert to the situation. And uh, when, you're, when you're calling them, whether they, what is their response? And awareness is in terms to their environment. It's being aware of where they are, with whom they are, what is happening to them. That is how you would distinguish the two of it. Thank you, ma'am. Um, and we have got a question from Dr. Anish. Uh, he's asking if there is any role of music therapy in delirium and is there any uh, any scientific backing for the same? At times, uh, music therapy in terms of like someone who is an agitated delirium, it may not really help at that point of time. But when it comes into practice and when is you're looking at sleep hygiene. So at times uh, before sleep, say uh, an hour or two, you would want to create an environment of soothing, calm, environment around the particular patient. So wherein a, a certain uh, soothing music can be played in the room so that the person generally tends to, you know, uh, calm down and then fall off and drift off into sleep. It may not really benefit in terms of, you know, an agitated delirium when you play music and the person might, you know, benefit with that. There have not been much studies as much as I'm aware about using music therapy in delirium as such. Thank you, ma'am. As an instrumental and such comments are coming in. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not a, 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 a expert in that yet. I think I would say that it would depend upon the preference of the person. Like, what would they like to listen to? I would say like that. Hope that's Arnav, that, so, that uh, sorts your question. Yeah, that's true, ma'am. Uh, initially, uh, during my early days of post-graduation, I had done a course on music therapy. So at, at that point of time, they are told that there are a, we, we, uh, the person who is the subject of interest has to undergo, we sit with them for a few sessions just to understand their liking in music. Yeah. Um, and then we profile that person and then only go ahead with choosing a kind of music and then give them sessions. Uh, and to see the effect on them. So it's, it's more of a trial and error thing as well. Yes. Uh, but even specifics of any, pers uh, of any particular kind of music, music is it like uh, uh, it, uh, it's relevant across the spectrum? I'm not sure. Of course, there is a but element of subjectivity in this. Absolutely. So ma'am, we have a case presentation as well. With your permission, we have another 20 minutes. If we could proceed to that before taking sure. more questions. Absolutely. Please go ahead. Sure. Dr. Smitha, over to you. Yeah, hi. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Smitha. I'm an anesthesiologist working in a tertiary care hospital. And um, first of all, I've I congratulate the, the organizers uh, for a wonderful course we have been having so far. And thank you, Dr. Kritika, for your wonderful presentation on delirium, which helps us shed some light on the topic. So uh, my case presentation um, is, is taken up not from a palliative care uh, scenario, because when I did present it, it, uh, it um, I'm, I can be very honest, it took me some time to get a case which I could 
and point and say this is delirium that I need to put forward um, and and make a, and present uh, um, forward to the to the attendees. But this is more from a very common scenario that we uh, see in a patient who is has been recently hospitalized. So here we have a patient uh, we diagnosed with a delirium with a history of a urinary tract in, uh, infection and with a recent uh, recent renal surgery um, in the sense that the patient had a, rain, a right ureteric calculus for which he underwent a lithotripsy and a DJ study. Next slide, please. Yeah. So this patient has been uh, brought in by her relatives and uh, she's been found wandering around uh, aimlessly. She was mobile, not that she was bed bound, but wandering around aimlessly with confusion and inattentiveness for the past two days and having no regard to personal hygiene from a week. She has not been sleeping ever since she came from the hospital after she had this kidney procedure uh, two weeks ago. Next slide, please. She's 70 year old. She's a known hypertensive. She has been diagnosed with the right kidney calculi uh, two weeks ago. She underwent uh, lithotripsy, right uh, DJ stenting. She had a urinary tract infection when she presented to the hospital. Uh, she was treated there, but ever since she came home from uh, discharge, she had not been sleeping, uh, not eating well, and st slowly started showing uh, neglect of personal hygiene. Over the past course of two days, more confused, aimlessly wandering, and was found only wearing her undergarments, being dirty, foul smelling. And it was very distressing for the relatives to see her that way. Yeah, next one. Uh, on examination, uh, she is afebrile. Her vitals were uh, stable. Uh, no pallor, rectus, sinusis, clubbing, uh, no mentrenopathy, no edema. Uh, she was uh, conscious, but as I'm not oriented to time, place, person, unresponsive to many uh, questions and seemed confused. She showed appearance of very poor hygiene, neglect of clothing, very restless and uh, agitated at times, avoiding eye contact, no signs of impending violence though. She had some irrelevant mumble words at times, minimum low responses. She's uh, unable to relevantly answer questions pertaining to her uh, mood. And uh, she knew her name, she knew where she stayed, but she couldn't tell the date and she's unable to describe the events surrounding her admission. Yeah, next. Uh, treatment uh, history, she, this, uh, what, what was brought by the relatives was that she was on this uh, anti um, superfluxin 500 milligram, which they were giving, which they, uh, she was taking uh, for twice a day, and, but she didn't remember whether she had taken it or whether the relatives didn't remember whether she had taken it. She has been on tab amlodipin 10 milligrams once a day for some time. Um, on blood investigation sent uh, from in the hospital, it was noticed that her hemoglobin was uh, 8. Hematocrit of 40, her platelet count 1,85,000, total counts elevated um, 17,500, neutrophilia primarily, sugars uh, 69, urea was 45, creatinine 2.75, uh, sodium of 145, potassium 4.9, chloride 109, urine routine showed uh, bacteria more than 100, and the leukocyte test is positive. Next slide. Yeah. Psychosocial aspect, she's a retired teacher and her husband passed away a, a few years ago. She stays by herself in a different town, but she came to her daughter's place after her uh, surgery. Though she had uh, supportive family members, uh, she is in an unfamiliar environment currently. Her daughter mentioned that she had been feeling and that she was troubling her daughter and her family because of, her, of the family because of her illness. She was asked to Increase of fluid intake, but she kept mentioning she didn't want to trouble people by waking up in the night, having to use the restroom. And there was nobody to monitor her medication being taken. Yeah. Next slide. Yeah. So in uh, summary, uh, the diagnosis made was that of an acute onset uh, delirium um, with a, in the background of a urinary tract infection with uh, anemia and dehydration as a super added factors which have pushed her towards the uh, her present situation and recent history for the treatment of ureteric calculi. Next slide. 
So discussion, uh, I would like to discuss about, it is a dangerous situation, but not just for uh, the patient, dangerous situation for the patient, distressing for the caregivers. She has been wandering aimlessly and she could put her life, her, her life in danger and also cause embarrassment because of being poorly dressed and with no regard for personal hygiene. Urinary tract infection, recent surgery, other antecedent factors, anemia, dehydration, we have uh, super added factors. Uh, could this situation have been prevented upon discharge from hospital? Could the patient family members be counseled about close scrutiny of the few finer details like medication, hydration, recognizing early features of delirium and the situation could have been anticipated? Uh, does the palliative care have role in this scenario uh, in the sense? So initially when I put in the case presentation, I thought that palliative care would be able to help her situation and her family members. Uh, but now I understand that we were discussing about delirium in a palliative care setting. So my case presentation is more of a, not so much pertaining to a palliative care scenario, but I just um, put this point across. Yeah. Can you next slide, please? Yeah, that's my case. Thank you. Dr. Smita, I would not say that, you know, although the topic was delirium in palliative care, uh, the role of palliative care is very much important in here in terms of a lot of these points that you've enlisted. That is how the role of palliative care actually comes in trying to support the patient, the family, in trying to explain them the anticipatory symptoms, managing this patient at home. So there is definitely a huge impact that could be done by the team and by uh, and even an approach that you could have. You know, having a palliative care approach is meaning just being cautious about the finer details, uh, trying to see as a whole person, not just, you know, focusing on a particular issue or a concern as of now, and then helping or, you know, at, paying attention to those finer details and then coming to a plan. So it's more of comprehensive planning that you would do here rather than fo focusing on only one point. So that's how palliative care input comes in. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. That you have beautifully presented the delirium in a palliative care scenario. I also want to point that very often in the intensive care and as a treating physicians, and, um, we label patients having ICU psychosis, we label them as encephalopathic, and we look at organic causes. If we're not able to pinpoint anything I mean, major, we will just label them as ICU uh, psychosis. It's a very, very loosely used term. I think we need to educate ourselves and uh, our fraternity because as physicians many a times we ourselves don't know that we are dealing with the delirium and how to manage it further yeah. and uh, thank you for shedding light on this today thank you so much for that it's very important as you highlighted it thank you dr smita so if uh, anyone would like to uh, or would have any questions regarding the case which was shared how to approach this case, uh, you can please unmute yourself or uh, you can use the chat box. So one question which I would like to ask is, ma'am, how would you like to, uh, like uh, you were saying that this is not much of a palliative care case, but however, one of the major, major principles of palliative care is correcting the correctable. So here we can see uh, lots of factors which needs to be corrected. But in this kind of a setting, how do we go about it? Um, is it is it that we start them on medications for delirium, or we know that there is uh, it's, if we start them on treatment with antibiotics uh, or uh, correct the anemia, and we start doing those things, even one dose will start making a difference. So so how do we go about this? Are we gonna so are we gonna start them on delirium medicines, or are we gonna do the correcting the correctables and then go ahead and if still delirium persists and only only then will we go ahead with with starting them on antipsychotics how do we go about this you pose the question to me or to dr almeida uh, first to dr uh, uh, dr almeida so that just to know what her approach is and then over to you ma'am i think uh, one thing is that one, uh, one has to anticipate that these things may take a turn towards delirium. When uh, I think it's the uh, role of the treating treating physician to anticipate that not just the cause, not just the battling of the uretric calculus would put this patient back on the path to recovery, 
uh, the treating physician has to be aware that these are the things if not taken care of like for example the hydration simple things like hydration and and um, i mean antibiotic a completion of the course of antibiotics and um, uh, treatment of the anemia of course definitely the patient would have been evaluated when being hospitalized for the uh, anemia but if they have to anticipate that if these things um are taken care of by education and by a, by orienting the, uh, the the family that this is a possible complication that can happen so one thing it can be it, it this situation can be prevented but once it i think the patient is brought to the um, hospital back with with the these symptoms suggestive of the patient having a, a, a delirium then i think the first uh, i'm definitely this patient would need to be admitted in hospital and correct the factors which have pushed the patient into the um, in, in this situation and i think as by dr atrika discussed i think the treatment of delirium would then also start simultaneously you know in addition to the treatment of the etio causes what has pushed the patient to this situation plus the treatment of delirium i think it goes hand in hand. both these things go uh, together and then uh, the family would definitely be distressed to seeing the patient the way they saw her and then they have to be also educated that this is very reversible what has happened is a reversible thing and it doesn't really mean that this patient has gone into so very often they brand patients that they've gone into that they they and the stigma associated with the psychiatry is huge so they always brand patient and they feel that they've gone uh, that that this patient is unstable but that has to be educated that it's a reversible it's reversible and i think everything has to go simultaneously that's my take on it. i would agree with dr almeida has said that you know with a correctly identifying so uh, i mean a simpler just to add to that you know to kind of give you a perspective if you kind of chart out what are the issues with her this particular lady it gives you idea in that what can you correct what can you palliate and you know what is intractable for which you need to continuously manage so then you will know where you need to pay your immediate attention to and you know look at what you should do for something that is intractable or something which is irreversible but you need to control it thank you ma'am so we have a, a question on the chat box so how can we differentiate between uh, delirium and encephalopathy anyone who wants to do, take that question it's actually mainly more of more or so similarly describing the same condition it's more like uh, delirium is actually more of the mental manifestation of that symptom and encephalopathy describes the pathophysiological process so it's it's a synonymous term but it's this is how you differentiate it it's not something like you know delirium is not equal to you know it's not it's something different to what encephalopathy patients will present with delirium is kind of like a, a symptom that will present in encephalopathy patients also so that's how it is it cannot be two different topics altogether it's synonymous to each other and and like uh, dr shantani has posted on the chat box encephalopathy will also have an organic cause either related to the liver or some organ deranged lfts uh, there will be a background to the encephalopathy as well uh, ma'am we have a question from dr arnab so uh, he is saying uh, he is asking that if there is a person like this without any relatives and he is found in front of a private hospital uh, how to deal with this patient are we is a, is a private hospital bound to like you know treat the person uh, look for the relatives or ignore the patient should be taken to a government setup how to approach this situation this is more of there, there are a lot of you know these questions it's it's not that this person is at completely at risk of death here so about you know when you talk about first aid trying to give the first initial management and then so 
I am not really the right person here to give because I may not have complete knowledge about administration rules and various state policies and hospital policies that you know come into place here. Because uh, as a situation, if seen, he is very right in saying that at times private hospitals might not even enter into, and uh, there might be more of you know uh, responding to the next police station to identify such a patient, and then the police is who involved into taking this patient to the nearby government hospital and then trying to search for the relatives while the patient is tended to in a government hospital. So it differs into state by state the kind of policy that they have for destitutes or for uh, you know such people around. Uh, very correctly said, ma'am. Also, like uh, over here in Trivandrum, there have been instances where um, we have had uh, such uh, patients come in, you know, brought in by somebody. Uh, they don't have uh, relatives or anyone around them. So what we do is uh, when we receive such a person, we report to the nearest police station first, make a report of it uh, so that, you know, in, in case even if we start treatment or if something happens over a period of time to the patient, later on somebody shouldn't come and say that why they weren't informed or uh, something like that. So we always have a legal document with us saying that we had informed the police and we are taking over treatment for the time being. And then through our network of volunteers, once the once the acute phase is uh, taken care of, once the patient is stable and the medicines have been titrated, then we will uh, look for other care homes for them, you know, NGOs or other care homes for them, where they can be taken care of on a on a on a larger span of time. Correct, absolutely. This this also helps, like you know, if the private hospital has a social worker department so wherein they can initially provide the first stage try to get this person stabilized at least evaluated and stabilized immediately attention given into like you know this person was wandering on the state as where she correctly pointed out was at the risk of self-harm so get this patient in manage initially find out report it to the nearest police station if relatives turn up then discuss if they want to continue treatment at the same hospital or if they're not able to afford it they have issues, financial constraints, then given an option to be able to safely transport this patient from their center to a government hospital or any other local center where this patient can continue care. So having a volunteer setup or a social worker department or coming being in touch or liaison with an NGO who works for this in your area can go a longer way in trying to manage. Absolutely, ma'am. So when we have uh, two more minutes before we end our session, I think uh, in the meanwhile, as we wait for another question or two, would you like to give any closing remarks, ma'am, on delirium? So as I said about my take-home points, so it's as uh, this case also brings up that idea, like, you know, is trying to complete, uh, evaluate it thoroughly. And uh, when I talked about trying to put those into points as in, keep it very objectively, the issues that you identify and group them up into issues which are correctable, which are intractable and you need to palliate so that you can assess and depending upon the goals of the care for this particular patient. So if the goals are only to provide comfort care, then you might not go in terms of going overtly to investigate for further any which might not change the course of management or the line of management. And rather than would just look at comfort care for this patient. So keeping in alignment with the goals of care, we should proceed with managing. Uh, so related to that, ma'am, we have had, we have got a question now from Dr. Rajini. She's asking how long does it actually take for death to occur after the onset of delirium due to a terminal illness? And does the primary caregiver may need some help during the occurrence of delirium in these patients? So what assistance can we provide to the uh, primary uh, caregivers. So as uh, Rajani has pointed out, it's very difficult to predict the time of death. It is only you can anticipate based upon the signs and symptoms that you see, which are occurring in an actively dying patient. And uh, it's, a, it's an estimate that you would always make that as is the person deteriorating hour by hour or day by day, or you know, uh, week by week. On that basis, you can estimate how much time that is possible. But you can never really predict because we've seen certain patients go on for a week and someone within a day, you know, worsening. 
so it depends person to person and uh, talking about help for a caregiver is important in terms of being there the support that they would need reassurance and explaining them why this is happening to their patient or their loved one and also making them understand about their concern is about distress the concern is about whether the person is in pain whether is the person really understanding what's happening to them and would that be causing distress to them so reassuring that it, the person may not understand what's happening and also uh, explaining to them uh, about your line of management what is exactly trying to do it's trying to control the symptoms trying to keep them comfortable so uh, at times you might even want to reassure them in terms when the person is continuously sleeping and that could be distressing to family members because in our culture it's about you know uh, having that last talk being able to you know give a feed before a person expires that is very important and they may be feeling distressed because at times they're not able to do that aspect so therein your your presence is can be a bigger support than anything else so all of these points you can keep in mind to look at you know providing help for the primary caregiver when a person would be in delirium or in terminal delirium thank you ma'am many a times we have seen that the primary caregiver the, the thing which distresses them the most is why this is happening why is he responding why is he worsening things like that so many a times we have seen if we just give tidbits of the pathophysiology as well so they know what not to expect once we sit with them reiterate it a, a couple of times they know what not to expect which which gives them sort of a closure uh, on it and we have one last question for the evening is icu psychosis same as delirium so yeah that's what as we like you know like a little while ahead pointed out that icu psychosis is like a loosely used term for it but mainly that whatever you call it as a, a mental manifestation is delirium itself it's the scientific way that you would uh, diagnose with this particular patient icu psychosis is something that we have just has a, a is like a term that you would call it for because if a person would have been in the icu for a prolonged stay and due to the altered sleep wake cycle uh, improper rest or a very sick status they might land up into that particular situation thank you so much ma'am for elaborately taking us through the topic uh, it's a pretty vast topic and the causes which can cause delirium itself is it can go on for hours of discussion correcting the correctable causes deliberation on the investigations which may be needed but at the same time from a palliative care perspective uh, seeing the patient as a whole seeing the feasibility uh, if the patient will be financially able to take it up or not uh, seeing the goals of care seeing the stage of illness so many factors come into play when we are talking about delirium from a palliative care perspective uh you have brought it out wonderfully during your presentation ma'am uh thank you so much for taking time out we know that you were busy till 505 uh you were the at the last moment till with the patient and then you ran uh, and got in for the session uh thank you so much for that ma'am always you. a pleasure to have you with us i'm uh, looking forward for more sessions with you as well thank you so much thank you dr kritika for joining us uh, your message at 440 came as a surprise and uh, your presence in the session at sharp 55 came as a pleasant surprise so thank you for that and please do take rest after this session <laughs> so uh, i hope that this was a very informative session for every one of you out there This is Sri Priya, along with Dr. Deepak Sudhakaran and Dr. Kritika, signing off from the Tips Echo Hub. See you in the next session. Till then, everyone, take care. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Bye bye.